Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19, Ethical Issues in the Management of COVID-19, brought to you by the Network for Public Health Law. I'm Charles Strong, the Senior Digital Marketing Coordinator at the Network's National Office, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. This webinar is the second in a three-part series co-sponsored by the Network for Public Health Law, the New York State Bar Association Health Law Section, New York City Bar Association, Health Law, Science and Law, Bioethical Issues, and Immigration and Nationality Law Committees, the University of Rochester Medical Center, Finger Lakes Geric Education Center, and the Collaborative of Palliative Care. The final webinar of this series occurs on July 9th and will focus on vulnerable populations and palliative care. Check the network's website for more details and registration for that event. We strongly encourage attendee participation and would love to hear from you, so feel free to submit your questions at any time during this webinar by using the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. All you need to do is click on that tab, select all panelists from the drop-down menu, and send us your question. We'll be addressing them during the Q&A session towards the end of today's event. Your moderator for today's webinar is Brendan Parents. Parent is the Director of Transplant Ethics and Policy Research and Assistant Professor of Bioethics in the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. For the New York State Bar Association, he serves as the Chair of the Ethical Issues in Healthcare Committee and as Editor of the Health Law Journal. Parent is a Fellow of the Center of Genetics and Society and Policy Advisor for Bellevue Hospital's Ethics Committee. While legal fellow for the New York Task Force on Life and the Law, he helped write guidelines for ventilator allocation during a pandemic. Brendan will be leading us through the rest of today's webinar. So Brendan, over to you. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, let me just see some nods from my co-presenters that you can in fact hear me. Great. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to moderate this event. Thanks to the Network for Public Health Law. I want to start by introducing our panelists for today. Nancy Neveloff Dubler is Professor Emerita of Bioethics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center. She is a member of the New York State Task Force on Life and the Law, and she is a faculty associate at NYU Langone Health. As consultant for ethics at New York City Health and Hospitals, she guided the clinical ethics consultation teams in acute care and long-term care through the maelstrom of the COVID-19 attack, helping to balance the restrictions of the law with the ferocious reality of clinical care. Dr. Joseph Finns is the E. William Davis Jr. MD Professor of Medical Ethics and Chief of the Division of Medical Ethics at Weill Cornell Medical College, where he is a tenured professor of medicine. At Yale Law School, he is the Solomon Center Distinguished Scholar in Medicine, Bioethics and the Law, and will be a visiting professor of law for the coming academic year. Dr. Finns is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, of the National Academy of Sciences, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Academico de Honor, honored academic of the Spanish National Royal Academy of Medicine, and a member of the New York State Task Force on Life and the Law. Alan Brudner is a litigator in a national law firm and has served as a federal prosecutor and as the head of litigation and investigations for a major financial institution. At his law firm, Catton Muchen Rosenman LLP, Alan works with the healthcare team representing and advising public and private providers in litigation, investigations, and compliance best practices. Alan also serves as the chair of the Bioethical Issues Committee of the New York City Bar Association, which studies bioethical issues, sponsors and co-sponsors programs not unlike this one, and provides the Bar Association with information and feedback on legal, legislative, and policy issues involving healthcare and biotechnology. I would like to start by saying that each of our speakers are speaking on their own behalf today, and they do not represent the positions or perspectives or beliefs of any institution. With that disclaimer, we're going to set some ground rules for today's discussion. This is, if you will, a bull session. 
our panelists are aware of the topics, uh, but they have no scripts. We are here to grapple with tough questions, to push on our own intuitions and biases, and to help ourselves and hopefully you develop deeper appreciation for reasons behind different possible courses of action. And maybe we can achieve greater confidence in some appropriate paths forward as the state of affairs will be with us for some time longer. I will be asking questions, some directed at specific panelists, but each are encouraged to respond without my prompting and to push respectfully on each other's ideas. We will reserve time at the end for questions. So please, if you have questions as we proceed, because we are in this unique online space, you don't have to rack your brain to remember something that you wanted to talk about earlier. Instead, you can, as Charles mentioned, Charles mentioned, use the Q&A feature to write in your question when you think of it, and I will be trying to flag them as we go along. Today's discussion will largely take place through the lens of the New York City experience. And I realize that many of you are not even in the tri-state area. For all I know, some of you could be on Mars right now. Um, but as New York City was the hardest hit place in the world for a while, our experience brought ethical issues into sharp resolution. And we hope that the hard lessons that we have learned might help you and others adopt our victories and hopefully avoid our mistakes. So final note before we begin, we are here to discuss ethical issues in the management of COVID-19 and perhaps the greatest moral failing of this crisis is the disproportionate impact on communities of color. I would like to acknowledge that this panel is without direct representation from communities of color. The fields of law and bioethics do not have enough professional diversity, although I am hopeful that this is changing. It is critical that we include the voices of those who continue to be marginalized. So one final, final note, Dr. Finns is going to have to leave us in about 30 minutes, so it is my goal to put him to work for the next 30 minutes um, while also bringing in our other panelists. So without further ado, Unless I see any uh, major flags waving, I'm going to jump into it. So let's start with our foundational ethical concern, which is public health goals and measures should override individual rights. We are a country founded on individual rights. Respect for the individual pursuit of the good life, we have a high threshold for when our rights can be superseded by government. And this framework in theory, I stress in theory, leads to healthy discourse, homogeneity of citizenship, respect for difference, and hopefully opportunity to achieve success. In the pandemic, it has led to frightening inaction and inconsistency in deciding when the danger posed to all of us should have triggered restrictions on individual rights and government protection. So the very first step, I believe, is recognizing that the normal standards of care in clinical settings no longer apply and must be replaced with crisis standards of care. So I'll start with Joe. What does this mean? Well, you've asked a temporal question, when do we make that determination? And I think that determination needs to be made long before the heat of the crisis in public deliberation, in, in public engagement. And that was, I think, one of the failings of the task force report. Nancy and I were both there at the uh, inception and, and we pressed for uh, figuring out precisely when that would happen. So, you know, to follow your point, there has to be some kind of, you know, declaration by a government agency, probably the executive, the governor, that, there, that we've entered a, into a public health emergency and we're gonna move into what the Institute of Medicine called crisis standards of care, where the goal is sufficient care, not the usual standard of care. Um, and, and this is at a time when you, you transform um, care, which is first come, first serve, when you have enough resources 
to kind of a utilitarian approach. Um, and, and it is, you know, at the expense of, of individuals. Um, and again, my, you, you look like you want to ask me a question. Well, I, I want to ask both you and Nancy a question, which is when government entities, whether it's the president or the governor or the State Department of Health, don't step up. Like well, that's, my, that's what I was going to say. I mean, I think right. even even, you know, in 2015, we were discussing this as a tabletop exercise. This was a political third rail and nobody wanted to be the, you know, the doctor death of, uh, of, of bioethics or health policy. Um, you know, so the idea was, you know, we probably uh, need to overcome the, the inevitable denial, the discounting, this stuff will never happen because when it does happen, it's too late and it can't be done as in a deliberate fashion the way it needs to be. Um, so so um, I think there are all kinds of political reasons why uh, people don't like to make these declarations and they don't want to think about making these declarations in, in advance. But but as our experience has shown, if we don't make these declarations, practices can be idiosyncratic and inconsistent, treat different populations differently and can vary from hospital to hospital, which is not, you know, people being treated equally across the spectrum uh, of, of, a, of a geographic region. And ostensibly, so that the clinicians or even the chief medical officers at the hospitals don't have to make these decisions, the governmental structure should provide these sorts of determinations in, in, in protections so that uh, it's not up to the hospital. Right. But this, this didn't happen, right? And so when it doesn't happen, how does the hospital, which says, come on, law, catch up, you're not working with us, decide, you know, we're just going to do it on our own. Right. And again, you know, we know from in New York City, different hospitals had different approaches to this. But I just want to get back since I am a clinician and, and I, this is my my brief you know, moment in the sun uh, with you luminaries. Um, uh, the, the burden of the government not stepping up and establishing guidelines or promulgating guidelines um, places a tremendous burden on clinicians. And, you know, we, we laud uh, the clinicians as being heroic and at seven o'clock at night, you know, we're still getting a little bit of a pause when we walk home. But not to a person, not a single one of us, uh, and I wasn't on the front lines, but no one really feels like they're a hero. They feel like they could have done better. They feel like they were taken, you know, they were redeployed. Psychiatrists were doing, you know, regular medical care. Uh, they were not enough intensivists to go around. So people were redeployed. Everybody felt that what they did was inadequate. It was a sufficient standard of care, but not really the usual excellent standard of care that we all aspire to. So when you add to that, the burden having to make these choices without government guidance, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awful kind of abdication and it forces people to be heroic. And heroism is a thin reed to, 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 upon which to practice during a pandemic. You just want professionalism. And why is heroism a problem? Nancy's disagreeing with me. It's a problem because heroes, we admire heroes because we ask them to assume a disproportionate amount of, of burden. And the burden was not equitably distributed uh, between the government agencies uh, and and the practitioner. But Nancy wants to disagree, I think. So, and before she does, I'm gonna ask her to unmute her microphone and we'll give Nancy a moment to add on to this. And then I'm gonna go to Alan with a legal question. So go for it, Nancy. Am I now unmuted? You're good. good. So I don't wanna disagree with Joe, but I wanna bring the discussion more specifically to COVID-19. So there are layers of responsibility. <clears throat> we know now that the national government assumed no leadership and provided no guidance. So that's one layer of responsibility gone. Now we come to the state. And I think that Andrew Cuomo is widely admired for the guidance he provided for New York in trying to get the city closed and the exponential spread stopped. But having said that, I think there were very substantial failures of government. One was for the health department not to provide crisis standards of care. Because what that meant was the moral burden of hard decisions 
fell exclusively on care providers. And the guidance they could be given without state authorization was opaque and insufficient because it needed to balance the advice of attorneys, that's their job, to give advice as to what the law says. <clears throat> with the maelstrom, with the havoc that COVID was causing in hospitals that did not permit, that did not allow for the sort of respect for statements of law that had priorly been in attendance. If you're in an emergency department and four patients are crashing at the same moment and need to be intubated and you have staff to intubate one, what do you do? And does the law help? And wouldn't it be more just to give some guidance for how these decisions should be made? So the lack of standards of care was a huge gap. I'm going to stop you there, Nancy. I want to ask, with that lack of standards of care, Alan, what are the legal concerns when a hospital says, Sorry, state, we need to operate under a new healthcare framework. Whether you've updated the law or not, we need to save more lives. What are the risks? Okay, well, just, um, I just want to make one thing here that I think wasn't, and maybe a lot of folks on the, on this, uh, in the webinar are clinicians, so they get it. But one of the things the state and the federal government was a, were able to do once the emergencies were declared was essentially relax a lot and, or, and waive a lot of the otherwise applicable sort of morass of rules. So there, there are two issues really. One is without the declaration, you're violating all, you're potentially violating all sorts of existing regulations. And the other is you're not being told what it is you're supposed to. Okay, so, but I want to stop. Know, we are going to get to, we are going to get to what happens when they're adopting these the new standards so let's i i, yep. I, I it's very important that we so, get back there so i just want to want to park for so, a moment and yeah so um, go for it so kind of looking at it from the framework of kind of what would it take for instance to um hold a provider a, a physician or a hospital sorry you all just went blank are you still there we can still hear you so so keep going okay um so, you know, what would it take, uh, you know, step one, one, one issue, one risk would be, what would it take to hold them liable in a med medical malpractice suit, right? Um, if they treat somebody, um, you know, as Nancy said, if there are four patients and one ventilator and three of them die because they don't get the ventilator, you know, is there a medical malpractice action that they then face for having made the decision that they made? Um, and, you know, if the, if we're talking about crisis standards of care, that, that sets a different standard. When a, when a lawyer is trying to prove a malpractice case, they're basically trying to show that a, that a physician or a provider did not act in accordance with kind of ordinary reasonable standards under those circumstances. And the, the declaration kind of says, these circumstances are extreme. Don't expect what you would normally expect from a physician in a normal circumstance with enough resources to deal with the problem. So that's that's very helpful. Um, we we obviously need to get to the conversation about what the new standards look like when they are codified in law. Um, but I think it's helpful before we go there to think more about the specific application of those crisis standards. And in part, it means that limited resources have to be allocated effectively. What does it mean to allocate resources? effectively. Nancy, I pitch it to you. How do we characterize the goals of triage in, you know, three words or no, no, just concisely. What are the goals of triage? Well, the uh, triage is a battlefield concept. And it basically says you have three groups of people. Those who are going to die anyway, 
leave them alone, let them die. Those who are going to get better, leave them alone. And those in the middle who will benefit most from medical care. That's the classic triage. In a pandemic, triage is much more complicated, as we've seen, because people came to the hospital um, at different points in their disease. One of the reasons it's now suspected that so many more African Americans died was that at the beginning of the pandemic, people were told, don't come until you're having trouble breathing. And for people who don't have good access to care and have not been cared for well by the medical system and who are afraid, they listened and they came too late. So this pandemic, we knew so little when it started and triage meant adopting the public health concept of doing the best for the greatest number. The problem with that is that it required such a different stride of practice from what physicians are used to. So we have been trained over the last decades to give a panoply of options to patients and families and let them choose. There was no time for that between mid-March and mid-April. You had to say, here's what we can do. Is that okay? That was a radical change. But if you were to triage in this pandemic and save the greatest number, you also needed to limit those you were treating. Joe, what do you think of that analysis? I, I agree. Um, and, you know, um, I think, you know, there were three words. I mean, there were three categories. And, and I think the, the challenge, I think, you know, is, is knowing that you truly have scarcity and resources were in, sometimes in the system, but not where they needed to be from a clinician's point of view. Some, you know, I think a lot of people were focused on ventilators. Um, we had sometimes had enough ventilators, but we didn't have enough personnel to manage the ventilators, so to do the intubation. Um, and, you know, and, and, the, and the, the just intensity of the arrival of, of this, really this notion of a surge of a wave upon wave, people arriving all at the same time overwhelming, you know, uh, pockets. And there were disparities, not only different populations affected differently, but different parts of, of New York City affected differently. And the mortality rates were reflective, not only of the, of the disparities among populations, but also the built environment. So for example, Queens, which, you know, socioeconomically looks a lot like Brooklyn, had much higher mortality rates because the number of hospital beds per 100,000 was fractional compared to these other, to the other boroughs. And so I think as we look as the pandemic spreads across the country, um, it's not just personnel but it's and, and, and populations, but it's also what kind of resources they have. Because New York City could, could, could go 300% up on their, on their intensive care unit beds across the city uh, and meet you know, the need. But if you're in a small rural hospital and you don't have that, that base of, of, of capacity, you can't do a surge to meet the pandemic uh, issues. But, but I think it's, it, you know, Nancy was talking about a, a change in stride of practice. Um, and, and, and it is totally uh, against this sort of patient-centered approach, um, the fiduciary notion of obligation that we have for our patients um, to, to actually begin to think about populations. But at a certain point, that's what had to happen in order to save the maximum number of, of individuals. Now, one of the things that the triage mechanism that was you know talked about but never implemented in new york was to disaggregate those who were making the triage decisions from those who were providing care to to per perhaps have some role sequestration to prevent bias but also to protect the clinicians from having to make choices which were very hard as they embrace the, you know their, their patients they have this responsibility uh, to individuals not necessarily to, to populations did you want to be sensitive to the you have about five minutes to go. 
you mentioned a couple things. You were talking about the disparity and the distribution of burden across institutions. Was there some way that could have been prevented, i.e. some hospitals ramping up capacity, having far more resources, and then other hospitals, public hospitals serving disadvantaged populations where patients are literally spilling out into the hallways? How right. could, is it, could it have been possible yeah, to I mean, redistribute? I, I won't mention specific hospital systems, but I know that some did transfer patients from under less served and uh, less resourced areas to to hospitals that had more uh, intensive care unit beds. I wrote a piece back in 2009 when we were talking about avian flu, talking about when endemic disparities meet pandemic flu, uh, and and I actually proposed that if if a if a bunch of ventilators came into the city in this hypothetical, that it go to the under resourced places first. I think we have to think about ways of you know equalizing resources that populations, you know, have as they go into a surge. Um, but again, this is the kind of thing that is very hard to do, but I, um, you know, it, you know, in the moment, but there were attempts that were made, but there were still significant geographic disparities um, that didn't always reflect, you know, the disparities that existed in populations. And I want to also stress what Nancy said about about individual populations. If you did not have primary care, if you had hypertension or diabetes or obesity, you were much more likely to have a serious complication of COVID and potentially have a higher risk of mortality than if you had good basic primary care. Simply having your blood pressure under control decreased the risk of, 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 of vasculitis and renal disease. Now, that's the other point. This was a totally unknown disease. And like nobody knew that two or three weeks into it, there'd be an epidemic of renal failure, right? And, and, and how could you, nobody was planning on a scarcity of dialysis or dialysate. Um, we were all thinking about ventilators. So there was a tremendous amount of unknown uh, factors here, biologically and clinically. I, I would like to comment on one point that Joe made, because I think it's really one of the great moral failings of government on all levels. And that is, so I work in the health and hospital system, which is the New York City public hospital system, and they take everyone. And a few of our hospitals, especially Elmhurst in Queens, were simply overflowing with patients. Now, there needed to be someone in New York City that looked at the overall bed capacity in the city and on Thursdays at noon said no more ambulances to Elmhurst. The ambulances will go to NYU, to Cornell, to wherever. That was morally mandatory and that did not happen in government. And the focus on the allocation of ventilators, as Joe said, proved useless when the epidemic of kidney failure came. But more than that, the general fairness of how patients were cared for was lacking. And if we are planning for another wave, that has to be the primary business of government to make a fair allocation of medical resources. And on that note, Nancy, it's 329. Joe, did you have a final word before signing off? I, I agree completely with Nancy, which is always a good place to end it. And, and again, my apologies for having to leave and, and uh, thank you uh, for doing this. And hopefully next time uh, the calendars will be more cooperative, but have a good session and we'll see you on the, on the other side. Well, Thanks. Appreciated. And we okay. will continue to represent you uh, throughout. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Good afternoon. Bye bye, Joe. Bye bye. Thank you. So, to this notion, uh, Nancy, of providing the best possible care under the circumstances and to implement triage effectively and efficiently. What are the core principles? How does this work? And I bring it up in context of the New York Task Force's guidelines on ventilator allocation. But as you mentioned, 
ventilators were not our biggest issue. In some ways, we managed to avoid that. It's questionable whether ventilator allocation should have happened in New York, New Jersey. But as you mentioned, we uh, were under-resourced for dialysis, for beds, for PPE, for medications, for analgesia. And ostensibly, the same sort of principles apply. And can you remind us, when it comes to multiple individuals who appear and need the same resource, and we don't have enough for all of them, how do we decide who gets the bed, who gets the medication, who gets the ventilator? just as a, as a foundation for the conversation? Well, um, as I said, the basic triage concept was a battlefield concept. The problem with applying triage to COVID is virtually all of the patients who came between mid-March to mid-April were at the same basic level of and many of the decisions, well, welcome back, Alan. Many of the decisions had to be made in an instant in the emergency department without adequate staff. Now, I'll tell you one of the things that would have made a huge difference at a certain point, rather than mobilize the army to put down um, loyal citizens protesting injustice, they did mobilize the army to provide staff. And I can tell you that when Elmhurst got army staff, they could take a breath and begin to work again. They had run out of staff. So first, there have to be adequate staff to make the decisions. Second, they have to be able to assess the patient in that moment in the ED without having the data they need to do so. And so you know what that means? That means it can't be done and it can't be done fairly. And the burnout for many staff today is that they feel, as Joe said, that the job they did was inadequate because they really don't know if some of the people who weren't saved could have been. And the moral distress that comes from that has been overwhelming. Those people who worked from mid-March to mid-April are exhausted and burned out because their basic ethic, which is do no harm, they're not sure they were in compliance. So I, we are talking about the uh, ways in which the systems are broken and the importance of having adequate structure ahead of time. I, I want to push us, however briefly, into the worst territory, which is in light of the inadequate preparations and the resources that were available, when it came down to the hardest decisions, ostensibly, those are to be guided by who will, as you mentioned, Nancy, are in that middle, middle category, those who would benefit from treatment, right? And this requires the difficult decision of saying some people are too sick and would not benefit. And so we cannot ethically justifiably treat those individuals. Some individuals are too healthy to warrant treatment. They'll be fine, hopefully. But then we have this middle category with, which is rife with ambiguity, right? And uh, we try to have these guidelines or frameworks for differentiating patients who are in that middle category according to likelihood of benefit. But at a certain point, our, um, our abilities to prognosticate and predict who is going to do better in that middle category is going to be limited. And so a number of our participants 
are interested in these questions about what happens when two people are equally likely to benefit. How do we decide what to do in those circumstances? Well, that, of course, <clears throat> your hypothetical needs to be augmented by the fact that many of the decisions were happening in the emergency department. So in the task force report that was never triggered, it relied heavily on a SOFA score, which is a score of the possible survival of various organ systems. But you have no idea what the SOFA score is in the emergency department. So let us say that one person is a 20 year old and one person is a 79 year old and that's all you know and you can only treat one. I think that is agonizing for staff, but there is some judgment that the 70, not based on, on discrimination against the elderly, but based on equality of opportunity, that the 20 year old has not had the opportunity to live a life and the 79 year old has. And if that's the only distinguishing factor and you're in an emergency room and they're both equally imperiled, I think there's good argument for favoring the 20 year old. But will the staff feel good about it? No, they will feel terrible about it. And not having the ability to treat both will haunt them. Very powerful uh, representation of the argument for the uh, prioritization of those who have yet to live through life cycles, which comes down to the question of prioritizing on the basis of age. What about other potential factors? You mentioned the task force ventilator guidelines. There are a number of these protocols, these guidelines, which suggest what to do in the event that you do not have the tools to distinguish two individuals in terms of their likelihood of benefit. And a lot of them go to things or qualities of life that might be experienced after getting out of the hospital, assuming they are equally likely to benefit who uh, might have the most quality life years when they get out or who has the least comorbidities. How do either of you, Nancy or Alan, feel about using these other sort of tiebreakers um, when it comes to deciding who gets care? You uh, want to take a stab, Alan? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I want to also make sure we, we get back to, can you hear me by the way? Yes. yes. I, I, I want to make sure that we also get back to age as a criterion, uh, even in the worst case scenario, because that's one of those areas where at least some of the ethical views may clash with the law. Um, uh, and we, we, you know, I can do that now, but you know, with right. regard to type. Do, uh, do the like, answer. Yeah, I mean, so one, you know, one problem with all of this is, you know, there's the reality of what's going on in the hospital, which is craziness during the pandemic. Then there are potential plaintiffs and plaintiff lawyers, and then there are government offices like the Office of Civil for Civil Rights, which basically, you know, are are taking the position, you know, rightly in most situations, right, that you can't. Um, you can't make decisions that result in disparate treatment of people um, for quote unquote improper reasons, right? And age is one of them and age is a very tough one, um, but it's one of them. And a couple of states that have had, that have written guidelines in an effort to try to deal with uh, this type of pandemic. Um, recently, Alabama and Pennsylvania have had their kind of rules that you know nancy started by saying new york should have issued more guidance that's true some states did issue more guidance the guidance was shot down because the, basically 
the Federal Office for Civil Rights said, you can't make age an explicit criterion. You could take, for instance, the SOFA scores, other sort of individualized um, uh, analytics about how healthy the person is and make a decision that the older person is not as healthy because age isn't the criterion. But, you know, the typical sort of um, factors that you would look at in a discri discrimination suit, age, sex, race, you know, et cetera, et cetera, are inappropriate. And, I, you know, I hear you because there is a problem that what do you do when there's no other criterion and you have two people dying in the emergency room and one is 79 and one is 20. But that is where the ethics and the law or not necessarily the ethics, but the, the decision that needs to be made to save somebody um, kind of clashes potentially with the legal uh, outcome. So let's think about the law for a second. In that state, what, what can you do and be legally protected? Is there any course of action that wouldn't force the doctor from a legal perspective to say, you know what, I'm wiping my hands of this. I'm getting out of town. There's nothing I could do that will not make me liable from a, from a legal perspective. Well, you know, that's, I mean, Nancy can speak to this better than I can, but that's why many of these potential guidelines that have been talked about take the hand, take the decision out of the hands of the individual physician, put it in the hands of a committee which reviews each patient, doesn't know the patient's name, it's all anonymized, but reviews the SOFA score or other health criteria and makes a decision about which is the better candidate. And, and, and then if it after all of that, you still end up in a tie. You know, I think you're, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I think you're literally talking about flipping a coin or some crazy thing like that, because what else do you do? So I want to add to the agenda three brief notions. One is I want to make sure we get to this question of prioritization of frontline healthcare workers. There's significant debate on that issue. Um, before we get there, I want to reemphasize the difficulty in preventing discrimination from creeping into even the most uh, well-intentioned attempts at being objectively, medically, clinically neutral when it comes to these kinds of decisions, right? Uh, there are a number of frameworks which purport that when there is a, a, a tie that needs to be broken, that we look to other clinical indications of long-term survival. But doing this means that we have to look to potential features of an individual which have been affected by long-standing uh, uh, broken infrastructures leading to poor diet, poor health, poor access to health care. And so if we say, look, each of these individuals is equally positioned to use a vent and then get off it and get back out in the world. So we have to say, you know what? The person who doesn't have stage one or stage two cancer should get it because that person with cancer isn't going to live as full a life when they get out. Well, what is the chance that that cancer is not the product of living in poverty and having poor access to health care? So do, do either of you have anything to say about these kind of external you know, value position and, and not to support or deny, but to add nuance to what I've just put on the table? I'd like to try. Okay. <clears throat> it seems to me that what COVID has done with the pandemic of Black Lives Matter, which is equally powerful, is to shine a spotlight on the sicknesses of American society. So we know that poor people who are disproportionately people of color do not have adequate access to care. We know that. And what we're now learning, there was a really brilliant article in the New England Journal of Medicine last week, which demonstrated that algorithms for care that are built into hospital guidelines have built into them discrimination based on race. Discrimination on race in American society is so deep and wide. 
and broad and profound that when it comes together now with COVID, it will have dramatic results for patients. And as we go forward, remember many people have lost their jobs and jobs are tied to health insurance and the Trump administration is cutting back on support for other sorts of insurance. And so if we get another wave, we're going to get more disproportion in patients who present for care. But finally, it seems to me that without structural change, without adequate staff, so that decisions don't have to be made in the ED, if you can get a patient up to a floor where you can do some testing, see what their SOFA score is, figure out if they have hypertension, if you can get some data on a patient, then you can make important distinctions between patients. In the emergency room, you can't, and fairness and justice fails. Alan, what about healthcare workers? If age is not a legitimate criteria, nor is race, nor is disability, can we justify ethically or legally prioritizing healthcare workers when we don't have enough resources for everyone? Look, I think there's obviously an argument in favor of that because the healthcare worker can then go on to help additional people. So by helping the worker, you're probably helping more than just that person. Um, the counter argument is the sort of um, this, this sense of conflict of interest, right? That the healthcare worker who is the healthcare profession is sort of backing the policy um, or favoring their own. Um, but, you know, I think there is a good argument for favoring healthcare workers and, and especially given that they've, you know, as Nancy knows all too well, you know, but risked their lives and their families' lives doing what they were doing. So, you know, oh. all of this, I mean, I just want to say all of these decisions could end up with legal liability if you, you know, all sorts of things, you know, malpractice being one thing, you know, frankly, you know, other sorts of regulatory or criminal issues being another thing. If you were to divorce everything that's going on with just what happened, if you just focus on just what happened, right? I didn't give this patient a dialysis machine because I didn't have one and died from kidney failure right? or you know, some other some other thing. Um, you know, if you were to get a, an aggressive prosecutor or lawyer who just looked at just the narrow problem, all of these things potentially could could create legal violations, which which you know what gets us to another question, which has to do with basically making sure that you give appropriate legal immunity to people in the healthcare community. So, so, so let's go there. Worry about we have we have about 10 minutes before I want to focus on the questions from our participants. Let's go to legal immunities for a moment and talk about the critical uh, protection that is either an executive order from the governor or regulation passed by legislature granting criminal and civil protection from suit for frontline workers who are doing the best they can with the circumstances they are given. And it recognizes that the doctors, the nurses, the social workers are slammed. They have very few minutes for each patient. Patients are spilling out into the hallways. They're wearing trash bags for protective equipment. Um, and we still really don't know how to treat this thing. We are learning so much all the time, but clearly the typical standards of care cannot apply. Uh, Alan, I'm hoping you can help us distinguish this sort of good faith effort that will provide legal immunity from uh, negligence and recklessness and potentially something even worse because we know doctors can't just do whatever they want in crisis standards of care. So where does the threshold go? So, look, I think, I mean, here we're really 
everybody we're talking about in this webinar is acting in good faith, right? Good faith is simple. It's acting with, you have pure intentions, okay? Um, we're not, it's a different webinar to talk about somebody who's intentionally killing people. Um, but the difference is between the different sort of levels of negligence, um, you know, kind of the negligence that uh, it takes for a plaintiff's lawyer to make out a malpractice case, which is not, which is basically acting not in accordance with the way a reasonable physician would under the same circumstances. That's kind of a low level. And that's the level of negligence. That's the, that's the level of competence that this governor and then the legislature in New York and some other states have said, we are gonna protect with immunity, basically a malpractice lawsuit based on negligence. That's, that's sort of when you cut through the language, that's kind of what it says. You could still be liable for gross negligence, recklessness, et cetera. And that's where it starts to get kind of less than clear, right? So in New York, we've got, we had originally the governor's executive order and then something called the Emergency or Disaster Treatment Protection Act, right? Which it ultimately protects for civil or criminal liability based on negligence. But then it says the immunity does not apply if it was caused by gross negligence, reckless misconduct, or intentional infliction of harm. And, you know, gross negligence, basically, some courts say it's extreme negligence, gross deviation from the reasonable standard of care. It's some one court has caught, said it's a twilight zone of potential liability because it's very unclear. I looked at a law review article before this uh, discussion titled An Overview of the Grossly Inconsistent Definitions of Gross Negligence in American Jurisprudence. So nobody knows what it means. It's just worse than negligence. Okay, so New let's, York, I, I want to let, let me just give you one. Go for it. One other thing is there are some states that have better laws than New York that are clearer and less. They, ha they have fewer potential uh, issues. And, and one example of a good one is Maryland. Um, Maryland basically says a healthcare provider is immune from civil or criminal liability if the healthcare provider acts in good faith and under a catastrophic health emergency proclamation, period. No argument about was it, what level of negligence was it, or et cetera, et cetera. It, saved the, it would save the legislature in Maryland a lot of time and effort having to negotiate with the hospitals and the plaintiff's bar and everybody else what the ultimate language would be. It's a great model. So, you know, New York has a helpful law uh, and, and much better than it was before, but it's, uh, there are still lawyers out there who will try to argue, um, you know, that there are issues. So with just a few minutes before getting to the, the participant questions, and there are some very good questions here, uh, I want to pivot just for a moment and think about potential ways forward. What are we going to do to get out of the crisis? And all signs point to the need for treatment, hopefully in the form of a vaccine. But as we know, vaccines take years and years to develop. And so this is leading to trying to innovate the notion of the typical vaccine trial. And one suggestion is healthy volunteer challenge trials, uh, which requires that young, healthy people volunteer knowingly, willingly to receive an experimental vaccine and then to be infected with the virus to see how this new vaccine works. Uh, the advantages to such a trial are that it ostensibly should take less total participants than a standard vaccination trial. It is cheaper and hopefully a far more rapid path to a, an effective form of treatment. So I, I'm gonna start by asking, uh, should people, even young and healthy people, be allowed to knowingly, willingly provide informed consent to volunteer to be infected to test a vaccine when there is no accepted treatment? Nancy. Well, I think it's a very difficult issue, but I think all told, I've come round to think that challenge trials are ethically acceptable. 
for the following reasons. One, there appears to be a cohort, people in their late 20s who have no comorbidities, who appear to get very mild cases of COVID-19. And we're, we have something, we, we know more about how to treat it now than we did two months ago. So if those people were to volunteer for the right reasons, now, I think informed consent is a fantasy because they're not consenting to something. They understand that they could get the virus. I think the very hard issue is whether they should be paid. And here, I've heard arguments on both sides. On the one hand, it's a sweetener that may um, get us more volunteers. On the other hand, it might be too much of an incentive if it's too large. And so one of the things we have to decide is what would the payment be? And are we getting a balanced cohort? If the only people we get are poor people, then you have to stop and rethink. If we're getting middle class people and wealthy people and across a spectrum of socioeconomic status, then I think I'm very comfortable saying that in this terrible pandemic, someone whose risk was low could feel an obligation to help others. So I'm in favor of challenge trials, but I'm suspicious because they must enroll a cohort which is representative of the population. And on that note, just to, to bookmark and flesh out, we obviously need these trials to demonstrate effectiveness for all people, including those who uh, are people of color and are disproportionately impacted, which means enrolling them in these trials, trials and subjecting them to the same risks, however low those might be, of potential serious injury or even death. And so this is not a, an easy decision to make, right? No. And we do not take it no, lightly. If we, if we control or health status across all volunteers, then I have not heard any powerful arguments for why black people would be more at risk than white people. So Alan, what are the legal risks to institutions and researchers who are choosing to conduct these trials? Um, well, one would be the same risks that we talked about before, uh, which would be um, uh, the government or someone uh, making a claim that they're being um, discriminatory, inappropriately discriminatory, or um, that, that they treat people in a disparate fashion. Um, there are potential claims that the risks were not adequately disclosed. You obviously need um, you know, legal consent, which is difficult when you don't understand what all of the risks are. Uh, I don't think it's impossible because, you know, we allow people to sign waivers and go skydiving and we allow people to sign waivers and, you know, try to go up in the challenge or when it explodes and, you know, ride a motorcycle or donate a kidney. So um, all kinds of terrible things can happen to you. You know, we, we allow somebody to buy a ticket to, uh, you know, go to a presidential rally and agree not to, you know, not to sue. So uh, there are all sorts of things we allow when people want to do it. Um, but, you know, there are there are issues. There are potential loss of licenses if uh, somebody determines that a known risk wasn't adequately disclosed. In this with this thing, um, with COVID-19, what's known about it seems to change on a day-to-day -day basis. So 
if you made the disclosure three weeks ago, you wouldn't have known necessarily to tell somebody because of your blood type, you might have a different outcome than someone else. Um, I, by the way, have a mild concern uh, that I, I've read, and I think Nancy mentioned, I mean, you're, they mostly want healthy, um, younger participants. And, I, you know, I think um, one of the issues is how would you get a representative uh, idea of how the vaccine would work in older people if some of the older people are not in the trial? Um, and I don't know why an older person is incapable of making an informed consent decision the same way as a younger person. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we take informed consent in law for all sorts of things, right? You can plead guilty in court. They tell you what all the risks are. You can go to jail for the rest of your life. We take confessions. We tell people, these are your Miranda warnings. You want to confess, we can use it against you. So in this, I think it's much harder and more complicated, but it's doable. Um, I also think there's one other kind of risk out there that's not necessarily a volunteer or suing for or his family suing for his or her family suing for not full disclosure. But if the company that does the trial is public um, and there's a problem that results in a financial issue to the company, the shareholders could bring a lawsuit and claim that these adequate inadequate disclosures led to issues. Um, that, that caused the stock to drop, for instance, and caused them to lose money. So that's kind of another issue floating out there. Um, but, you know, I think there are lots and lots of uh, potential legal issues. But at the end of the day, I think uh, consent probably, you know, goes a long way in, in making this um, acceptable. I should I also mention that there is immunity. I, so I tried to find whether uh, the government has granted any sort of waiver or immunity in connection with these trials to companies. And I do think that in the um, in the PREP Act, which is the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, um, these trials may be covered by uh, essentially the government's statement uh, that it would not uh, hold liable um, companies that are involved in sort of um, you know uh, PPE and other things, including potentially drugs, and I think vaccines probably fall into into that category of potentially being legally immune. So um, it, it may be covered from a lawsuit. I think it's uh, a powerful note to transition to the questions on that is uh, bolstered by a couple of comments in the Q&A space, which is that um, our choice to assume the risk of an activity that might contribute to saving humanity uh, is perhaps uh, a obviously just as ethical or more ethical than allowing people to assume the risk to ride a motorcycle or bungee jump. So with that in mind, in, in no particular order, I've flagged some questions here, which um, either expand on our conversation or pivot the conversation. One here asks um, about the mask wearing policy. And obviously the issue of masks is one of the most uh, uh, explicit and obvious uh, uh, tensions between the need to protect public health and individual rights to have your beautiful face shining out in the world. Um, the question is, many states that are currently experiencing surges in COVID, COVID cases are changing their policy on mask wearing to be mandatory, which is great in theory, uh, but how can we effectively enforce this policy through police, businesses, airlines, um, how do we enforce mask wearing effectively? Well, I'll take a first stab at that. We do it by creating morally responsible norms of behavior. And we do that by having our leaders demonstrate morally responsible forms of behavior. Unfortunately, we have leaders who don't demonstrate morally responsible patterns of behavior. And so the nation has been given very different guidance about wearing masks. And since we know how important it is, it's up to the governors and mayors to make certain that people wear masks to save others. How are we going to enforce it? It's going to be a mess. 
What do you think, Alan? I think every time we give an institution advice about compliance programs, we always say it starts with the phone at the top. And all I say is amen to what you just said. So another question is, gets at the, the current state of regulation and public health measures uh, and how they are being relaxed in some places, some states, and we are seeing these new surges uh, in infection and spread and a concern that in states like Arizona per se, uh, there are going to be just as many or more under-resourced institutions that are going to have to face the threat of a new surge um, when the government isn't taking leadership. What kinds of advice might we give to these institutions that do not have the legal anything even close to the legal protections that at least we have retroactively applied in New York when preparing to deal with the uh, potential oncoming surge? Nancy? Oh, my heart breaks for these places that watched what happened in New York and didn't prepare for the possibility in their areas. So belatedly, I would think Arizona has to stop all admissions to the hospital, clear out all of its hospitals, try to get ready for a surge of COVID patients, learn from us that if they don't have staff, ask for military help, be certain to set up a statewide system for which patients go to which hospitals based on an assessment of ability to care for patients. I mean, we know what a state must do. And my guess is that these states that are now belatedly being assaulted need to take all these lessons and put them in place yesterday. And assuming that the reality will be upon them just as it was upon us, we have another question here which talks about protection for withholding and withdraw treatment decisions. And for some background, it is canon in patient rights that we each have the right to choose in the event that our heart stops not to have heroic measures performed to resuscitate us, right? This is known as the DNR order, which we can put in our advanced directives. There are frameworks in every state for surrogate decision makers to help make these kinds of withhold or withdraw treatment decisions in the event that we do not have capacity and do not have an advanced directive. But then some states go a little further. California and Texas both have laws that protect the clinical team or enable the clinical team to choose either a withdraw or a withhold treatment decision if continued care would be medically ineffective. And these states have very complicated, nuanced laws that require oversight. For example, Texas, whenever Texas chooses to withdraw or withhold care without consent from the patient or a surrogate decision maker, an ethics review has to be performed. Interestingly, New York is silent on this. There's no explicit protection or prohibition of a clinically driven decision to withhold or withdraw care what is the argument for making this capacity available in the clinical setting when we have to operate under crisis standards of care? Nancy. So I want to make a distinction in the first place between withholding and withdrawing care on the one hand and responding to an arrest on the other. So if you have a patient who does not have a do not resuscitate order and that patient is COVID-19 
and it is clear to the clinical team that this patient will not survive a resuscitation attempt. And they also know that a resuscitation attempt on a COVID patient does potentially presents the greatest risk to the healthcare providers. In those circumstances, I think it is appropriate to say to the patient or surrogate, we are not going to provide a resuscitation when your heart stops because you will not survive it. Most surrogates will come around and agree. It's not made as a question. This was the change in approach during COVID. It's not, do you want us to resuscitate your dad? It is, your dad will not survive resuscitation. We will not be providing it. In most cases, the surrogates understood and agreed. Occasionally, they absolutely demanded resuscitation. And what we all then agreed informally was that for the emotional well being of the staff, dealing with a family adamantly demanding resuscitation required one round of a very less than rigorous resuscitation attempt. That made everyone uncomfortable, every single person. But there, the demand of protecting the staff who would be offering care of no benefit to the patient and greatly enhanced risk to themselves seem to all of us to be an ethically appropriate route. I'd like to stop there and get Alan's comment before I go to withdrawing and withholding. I mean, I agree with you um, on how, on the ethical point. Um, there is a legal, there is legal risk if you're in a state like New York where there's no immunity, legal immunity. Um, you know, uh, I mean, frankly, there's risk of criminal prosecution. Um, you know, I've got the man's, the New York manslaughter statute in front of me, um, as crazy as that sounds, manslaughter in the second degree, person's guilty when he recklessly causes the death of another person. Um, an argument could be made that withdrawing event causes the death, although your, your, your argument would be- I'm not no. up to withdrawing yet. Right. I'm not, okay. I'm just at resuscitation. Okay. So, okay, so it's, you know, if it's just a refusal to resuscitate, again, you could argue, uh, I'm not saying it's a winning argument, but a, a prosecutor could probably make an argument that um, what, what caused the death was the refusal to resuscitate. I think you would argue the person is essentially dead unless resuscitated. And so, and you could also argue justification as a defense. And I'm not saying this is a case any prosecutor would bring if he's rational, uh, he or she is rational. Uh, I'm just saying it's a risk and in the hands of the wrong lawyer in the wrong circumstance, that could be a case someone would try to bring. That's and, the and risk Nancy, that you're taking in the hospital when you make that decision. And Nancy, we definitely need you to go on to the withholding distinction, but I think to frame both, we have to recognize some other additional circumstances of COVID-19 which is that the closest advocates for the patient are not going to be in the hospital with the patient because of the restrictions on visitors. And so how can we ensure that these decisions, whether they are a decision not to resuscitate or a decision to withdraw, are not allowing implicit bias to creep in because the clinicians are rushed from patient to patient. They have to make these evaluations about when care would not be effective. Uh, so dealing with that on top of, 
how difficult this would be to make in normal times. So. Yes, I mean, you're reflecting for those people who have not been part of the surge in this pandemic. It is total craziness. For people who haven't been there, it is staff who haven't slept, who don't have PPE, who have patients dying and coding. It's madness. But, and I hear what Alan is saying, and I hope that prosecutors will look at this pandemic and understand what happened. So now let me come to withdrawing withholding. It's been very hard in the pandemic because one of the things that happened is that families were excluded from the hospitals and from the critical care units. And they couldn't see what the patients looked like. The only families that were let in in many hospitals were families of patients where they had agreed to move to palliative care. And once the families came and saw what the patients looked like, they understood. So there have been some articles in the literature that argued that in fact it was unfair of families, unfair to families to say to them the only way you can come and be with your loved one is if you agree he's dying. On the other hand, once they got there and saw what the patients looked like, all obtunded and, and sores and difficulty breathing, and it became clear they were dying. So here you have families who have not seen these patients. And here is one of the hard risk balance calculations. If you have a patient where you think it's appropriate to withdraw or withhold care, because this is a patient in the ICU. You have your SOFA scores. You have everything. You know what the patient is doing and what's happening. Maybe we have to let families come in. Maybe we have to let them come in and see and be part of the decision. You will still have some families who will say no. But it is my experience when a patient is dying, it is so overwhelming to see it. And it is so clear that it is happening. And so excluding families makes this a much more difficult decision. And if we get another surge, please, Lord, let it not happen. I think we have to cover families in PPEs and permit them to come in and be with the patient and say goodbye. That would be my approach. Alan, would that make sense to you? It certainly does. There's nothing I can add to that. That's it's a terrible, and, terrible situation. And as we know, patients, families have been excluded because of the risk it poses to them. So that's why Nancy suggests before implementing this policy, ensuring we can cover them in PPE and balance this risk. Is there perhaps an opportunity for telehealth to play a role here, which is being able to, if, if not, if we feel that it's too risky to expose families to show them, you know, over the, you know, the, the, the secure video chat and Nancy says no doesn't work in the same way. 45 years of doing ethics consultations, they have to be there. They have to touch the person. There needs to be that contact. I think we made the wrong decision the last time around. So we have 10 minutes left and we want I want to get to more of these questions. I will also encourage all of our participants
to take a look through the Q&A chat. We obviously will not be able to get to all of these, but there are some very good questions as well as some very good comments, uh, including potential additional resources that we might um, uh, peruse. I'm going to go back to this question of prioritization for healthcare workers. Someone asks, what about other essential workers such as grocery store workers or long haul truck drivers? Uh, why is it fair to prioritize the frontline medical workers and not these other deemed essential service providers? Alan, thoughts? How do we how do we manage that? I I don't know the answer to that other than that uh, it sounds to me it, it makes some sense to me, but it also sounds like the start of a slippery slope in terms of who makes those decisions and uh, you know do you really want you know politicians making decisions about who's more important than who. Um, I think that's kind of a dangerous area to get into. See, I, by and large, don't trust politicians to do much of anything. And I certainly would like to keep them as far away from crisis healthcare decision making as we possibly can. So I think that the argument for making, for giving healthcare providers some priority in treatment is because they really took the greatest risks. Now, I mean, so many people in this society, as we can see from those who've gotten ill, took tremendous risks and they were mainly people who could stay home. But I am, I would rather not make that a priority. I would rather make a priority having access for all the people who need access. In New York, that meant someone had to assess bed capacity every day and direct ambulances to the right facilities. That's what I want to fight for. Not for priority for healthcare workers, but for a sane, just, fair policy for all people. And by the way, I, I saw one of the questions was about the New England Journal of Medicine article that I mentioned, and it's called everyone hidden in plain sight, reconsidering the use of race correction in clinical algorithms. And the first author is um, Vyas, V-Y-A-S, and it was published on June 17th. Please read it, everybody. It's a shocking article on how racial distinctions are used against people of color. You can Google race correction in medicine and be shocked the degree to which these unsubstantiated notions of race as a proxy for differences in physiology and biology continue to manifest in medicine today. Uh, another Can question. Can I uh, just interject one quick point? I just want to add one point. On the question of priority for healthcare workers, I just want to add one thing. When we're talking about healthcare workers, I mean, I, I think I have a view that they should get priority, but I'm not only talking about the emergency room doctors and nurses. I'm also talking about basically, you know, the people that work in the hospital behind the scenes, the people that clean the toilets, the people that you know, are serving food, uh, you know, everybody who works in those places is exposing themselves and taking the same risk as the physicians. Um, so it's, it's, it's beyond just, you know, the professionals in the hospital. Uh, a critical okay. point. Uh, someone here asks how we can uh, recognize that so much blame has been placed on health departments, um, but hospitals receive funding to establish healthcare preparedness, 
do we think that hospitals might have some responsibility too in not having adequately prepared for the present circumstances? What do you think, Alan? I think hospitals are doing everything they can and they are not getting nearly the kind of guidance and assistance that they should be. I, I hope that we're I hope that the one thing this pandemic does is lead everybody to kind of prepare in the right way for the next one and not have to go through this again the next time some virus comes here from somewhere. Um, it's it's I think it's what the government's done in this case largely has been atrocious and um I, I don't fault, I, I don't know what, I obviously don't know the situation in any particular hospital, but in general, I think the hospitals have done an amazing job with, with what they have and what they have isn't nearly what they should have. What, Agreed. About, what about paying for tests and treatment? Uh, I, I know of some anecdotes, some, uh, some friends who have either lost their jobs or nannies for uh, my son's friends who ha uh, were infected went in for diagnosis and treatment um, and were infected and received a bill for thirteen thousand uh, dollars which they cannot pay uh, who should pay for tests and treatment in a pandemic and this is a question from don't hold me responsible for this this softball <laughs> It's such a good question <laughs> that people are charged for testing in a pandemic is an obscenity, is a total obscenity. The fact that testing is not clearly available at no cost for every citizen in America is an obscenity. I think that about. I don't know how else to say it. I think that's right. So, with our remaining three minutes, I want to draw attention one more time to this notion of disproportionate impact, both on communities of color, but also on the elderly, and how nursing homes were among those hardest hit. Um, obviously, prisons as well. Uh, what do we think could have been done to prevent these disproportionate impacts? And what absolutely needs to happen now to protect them in the fall and the winter when we see COVID come back with the flu and vengeance? I'll take a first shot. The nursing homes were just a catastrophe. It comes from lack of staffing, lack of preparedness, lack of understanding the risk. I, and many of the nursing homes that were hardest hit were for-profit nursing homes for the maintenance of profit. And I think that's pretty terrible. Prisons, as Brenda knows, I spent 35 years of my life doing prison work and prison and jail health care is to me a real lens into the sickness of our society and the way we lock up people unnecessarily for various so-called crimes. And then when it was clear that they would be greatly affected by COVID, our ability to take people who are not a danger to others and have them moved out was severely limited. You look at a society and how it treats its most vulnerable to judge 
its moral acuity. And I think our society has failed in nursing homes and in prisons. Alan? And I know that nursing homes were put in a terrible situation because um, they were basically forced to take a lot of COVID patients early on. But um, the other thing I can say is this is the second in a three-part webinar series. And on the next one, Mary Beth Morrissey, who's something of a nursing home expert, will probably talk about that at some length. So, um, there's, a, there's a move in New York to remove that legal immunity that we talked about with regard to nursing homes. And I think that would I think they were, there were definitely were issues, but they were put in a terrible situation. And if we could take the energy to uh, uh, improve and fix racial injustice um, that is hopefully being brought to attention across the US now and parlay that into uh, helping improve social determinants of health, maybe then we can see a difference in what comes next it is now 4 31 i want to give a huge huge round of thanks to our panelists nancy allen and joe i want to thank all of our participants who stuck it through to the end i want to thank all of you for your excellent questions and comments in the box i'm sorry we weren't able to get to everything and as alan mentioned please check back the network for public health law's website to uh engage in future webinar activities, some of which are happening very soon, including the one with Mary Beth Morrissey that Alan just mentioned. Uh, it has been a, an enlightening pleasure, and uh, we hope that this has been helpful as we uh, prepare for the next steps in the crisis. Thank you all so much. And uh, with that, I'll ask if Charles has anything um, to add. Um, otherwise, we can leave it here. I think I'm good. Thank you all again so much for your participation today. Great. Thank you and take care. Thank you so much, Brendan. You were terrific. A leader and director for our discussion. Thank, thank you, you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. I agree. Thank you. And, and thanks, Nancy, as well.